All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am delighted to be joined by the godfather of CRM, Paul Greenberg. How are you doing, Paul? I'm good, although uh, I actually still think that the godfather was somebody like misreading something and it was really the grandfather of CRM. <laughs> I think I'm the oldest guy in the whole industry. Yeah, well, uh, the reality is Paul has forgotten more about CRM than most of us will ever know in our lifetime. So uh, uh, Paul has written a, a, a number of books, uh, including the one that uh, is known as the Bible of the CRM industry, which is CRM at the Speed of Life in its fourth edition, I think. Yeah, four editions, nine languages. Absolutely. And he's just written a new book called The Commonwealth of Self-Interest, self Customer Engagement, Business Benefit. And we're going to come to that in a moment. But I just want to say, here's an interesting thing. So we're in 2019. Yeah, we are heading toward, heading rapidly towards 2020, which is just amazing. Uh, and yet there are still companies out there, and, and we come across them sometimes, even large companies who either don't have a CRM or don't really use their CRM. And, and that seems amazing in, in, in 2019. What, what do you attribute that to? Well, you know, look, I mean, there's a lot of different reasons for it. I mean, one of the big reasons are there are companies, depending on size, of course, I mean, the smaller you go, the more uh, frequent and obvious, or the more frequent this becomes, who are young, growing, and somewhat technology averse, really, because a lot of their business has been handshakes for years, you know? And, and it's not that they don't use any technology, but they tend to use Word you know, pretty much in Windows 10, and that's about it, you know, maybe Excel too. But when you have, look, CRM's value, and it's always been, comes when you don't know your customer base as well as you personally knew it before, right? And, and it comes to a point where your customers are not all your friends, mm -hmm. right? And, and at that point, CRM becomes a legitimate and reasonable uh, system for business ops, which is what it's kind of turned into. Um, the, the, on the, on the, so when you have the companies who are not implementing CRM is because they've been small enough over time right. to not have to, I don't use CRM really. I am, I'm, I'm the godfather of CRM with the Bible of CRM. I don't use one. Why? I'm me. Yeah. I, have, I have literally everything I need on one Excel spreadsheet <laughs> and I don't even look at that that often really. Yeah. Right. I, you know, I got a hand and it signs contracts and I use DocuSign and things like that. But the reality is I have no reason to have a CRM system in my house for one person. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, the, that said, as you grow, the value becomes increasingly or, or it becomes increasingly important for you to even be capable of running your business. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the part that when you get to the larger stages where they're just using it poorly or, you know, let's say using it with uh, uh, half of the value you actually could get from it, even though you might be using that half pretty well. Mm -hmm. It's because of there, it's for two reasons. You know, you'll typically see some, one is, you know, we've done this for years this way, no reason to change this now, which is the one we've always heard all the way going all the way back into the 90s. You know, it's always been the same aversion, which is I'm already, I've already been successful at this level doing it this way. Yeah. Or two, um, the other reason is they simply don't understand the actual value it has. A lot of people buy systems without full knowledge of what value the systems bring. You know, um, it's not an a, a, unusual situation. So one, one example, true story too, um, many years ago when people stuff was still a CR, had their CRM system mm -hmm. around, I got this call from this guy who I knew was running a consulting company. And he was telling me about this client of his and he was kind of asking me what to do about it. And the client had just said, called him up and said, and I'm not kidding, <laughs> this is really what he told me. Uh, Listen, we've just bought $8 million worth of PeopleSoft CRM. What do we do with it? Oh my goodness. Uh, right, and that's pretty extreme. You guys would be sure. kind of ironic to have spent $8 million without having a clue what to do with it. But, um, but that said, let's say some, form of that exists in a lot of places. I know another company who's a very smart company generally, but probably uses a 10th of their Salesforce automation capability, you know, mm -hmm. the, the products they have. 
They probably use a tenth of it. They pretty much use it for what you would expect, real basic stuff. Count, yeah. opportunity, contact, lead, management. Yeah. And that's it. And but, I, they, but they could do, with what they actually bought, they could do a hundred other things, which actually will ha would have some value for them, but they don't. Yeah. So, and, I, and I think that's an unfortunate thing is, as you say, is like, you know, companies get bigger or they, or they, you know, maybe their customer changes or whatever it is. And they say, okay, oh, now we need to implement CRM. So they just buy CRM and implement and there's no, there's no real thought that goes into it. There's no change management process, nothing like that. And as a consequence, then you consultants make a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, no, you know what? Yeah. Or I mean, it dies on the vine. Make a lot of money. My job's prevention, not, mm. not cure, yeah. right? You know, and so, uh, you know, the thing is, on that level, look, when it boils down to it, we live in an outcomes-based world if we're doing things right, meaning uh, we've already figured out the outcomes we're looking for, and all the CRM will help do is run the operations that will enable those outcomes potentially. And again, Look, if we take the view we all have, or at least I had of CRM back in the day, yeah, uh, which is two decades ago, I had a much bigger view of CRM than it actually turned out to be, which is I wanted, I, my original definition, which was pretty well accepted by the industry at the time, was philosophy and a business strategy supported by a system and technology designed mm -hmm. to improve human interactions in the business environment. And if, you know, if it had gone that far, I would be a very happy man today. <laughs> Now, when people talk about CRM, they're talking about technology, period. Yeah. And it's yeah. operational, too. It's yeah. not even, even you know how we have the, uh, the analytics and the operational and all that? Well, the reality of CRM right now is it runs your customer-facing business operations, and that's what it does. But the, the value of it is it does it really well if you use it right. And that's yeah, the thing. Yeah. And we're talking about an industry with what? You know, you take uh, 30, 37, $38 billion worth of, technology being sold and service being sold every year and with and gardeners forecasting double yeah. digit growth for the next what five or six or eight years yeah, absolutely so you know it's still mm. valid viable and necessary it's gone mm. from nice to necessary yeah. to run business operations as you scale yeah and and if used and as you say if if used properly and to be honest if used even more properly if you like it has this, this great strategic insights and strategic things that you can you can do with it so let's let's talk a little bit about uh, the commonwealth of self-interest i love the title by the way it's a fantastic title um so um give me the genesis of this book <laughs> i think i wrote the book because i really like the title <laughs> <laughs> you got the title I, I first. I've been like using that term for like ten or twelve years, mm -hmm. and I mean, there's a concept with it, of course. But yeah. but that, I just loved that the way it sounded. Right. So uh, so here's the, here's the two the two principles there. Obviously, mm -hmm. the title of self interest and commonwealth. And we'll start with self interest, and this really goes to the heart of the book. So we have what seven and a half billion people roughly on the planet, right. and there's only one thing we all have in common at all just one. And that's that we all want to be happy. Mm -hmm. That's it. And we all have a path or a journey to happiness that we want to be on. And as life moves on, we pick and choose our path and we change the path. We may dramatically veer from it. We may change it altogether. We may stick to it, fall off it every now and then, get back on it. But one way or the other, there's a path toward that happiness. And on that happiness path, we want to be happy on the journey itself. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's sim the simplest definition of self-interest I could possibly give, which is it's I am as a human being, an individual human being in a life that I want to be happy in. And if I leave this life having done good things, I've had a good life. Yeah. All right. Now, how we interpret all that, leave that for another day. Sure. Um, now, here's the thing. Because we've had a communications revolution over the last decade and a half now, um, how we communicate, with whom we communicate, why we communicate, what we communicate, uh, the expectation of communications has all changed. It's, it's transformed business, well, it transformed every institution on the planet and the vast majority of people on the planet. One of the, let's say, the categories of institution that's transformed is business. Yeah. And it's changed what customers expect from businesses because now we have lightning fast, real-time, 24-7 communication 
It's what we expect of the businesses that we communicate with, right? Mm -hmm. Which is mean interact with, which means transact with, yeah. too. Consequently, the businesses have to figure that out. Number one is how do they communicate in the way we want to be communicated with, number one. Number two is this. I have interests, again, on that path to happiness that are different than this guy right next to me, than yeah. different than yours, than yeah. different than, you know, uh, the New York Yankees over there. You know, I, I have all kinds of interests that are not yours. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there are some things we do have, you know, similarly or, you know, identically, potentially, that are there too, that even though they may be mixed differently on mm -hmm. our path to happiness. The problem most contemporary businesses have right now is how do you satisfy my need and my requirements as an individual without going bankrupt, right? <laughs> and yet you're a company with, I don't know, 200 million, 300 million customers, or mm -hmm. even 5 million, or even a million, or even 50,000 customers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you satisfy the needs of the individual to the point you can without going bankrupt? Well. There are a number of ways you can do that. Now, look, my, I am a, obviously, look, I, I, I don't think CX, you know, is, uh, in the customer experience's yeah. definition does not get, which means how a company, a customer feels about a company over time. You can't enable that with technology. You can mm -hmm. build experiences, you can do yes. all those things, but you can't enable how I feel about a company over time. That's my emotional state. Yeah. Right? So that's not happening. However, you can engage, and there is technology to support and enable engagement. Right? And engagement, my definition of customer engagement is the ongoing interaction between company and customer offered by the company chosen by the customer. Right. Because the ultimate thing that makes me happy as an individual and you and everyone else is that we have some control over the life we're leading. Mm -hmm. Not that we can't have 100%, it's impossible. But we can have some. Now, if the company is willing to offer me the kind of control I need, to make the right choices on how I want to interact and transact with that company, I'm going to like that company yes, because it's yeah. the choices I'm looking for. And, they, and in order to do that, they have to know enough about me to give me those choices. Mm -hmm. but if they give me a choice of, you know, will, will offering me, um, I don't know, uh, 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 one of the five choices I get is a day spent with the president, I'm going to hate them, right? right. Uh, you know, or if they offer me, well, you can get the point, right? So on the other hand, if they say kitty cats, I'm going to love them, right? So <laughs> or the Yankees, I'm going to love them, right? So, but they have to know something about me. That's yeah. where Commonwealth starts coming in. So what's the, what's the idea? All right. We know this. Historically, there's lots of data out there. Lots of data we're gathering. We know all about big data, all that. Yep. But ultimately, we're looking for insight. So what, what do we have to do? On the one hand, we have the historic traditional kind of data we always got, which is the demographic data, transactional data, all the other stuff that's sitting in databases somewhere that we've gathered over some years doing with, with that customer doing some things. Mm -hmm. All right. Then there's all that other stuff that we've been talking about. We call it, used to call it unstructured data. There's some other name yeah. for it that's escaping me at the moment. Well, what's that? Well, that's, you know, my hobbies, my interests, my mm -hmm. likes and dislikes about that company, my color of the, the color of clothes I'm wearing, but depending on the Instagram account I have, right. you know, blah, 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 blah. There's lots of data that's not in your databases right now, but it is available out there that, as a smart company does, is significantly, constantly out there trolling for that data. And right. they're getting it. They're mm -hmm. capturing it. They're capturing my conversation with so-and-so about hashtag fail, right? Mm -hmm. Blah, 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 blah. Well, you take that in combination, and here's what happens. On the one hand is Paul Greenberg. I had all these things that are interesting to me, but you're a company with 200 million people. And mm -hmm. as Paul Greenberg, I don't care about the constraints you have as a company, which are legal, you know, financial, sure. uh, regulatory, et cetera. And on the other hand, I don't care about the other 199,999,999 customers you have either, unless it's family related. Right? Sure, yeah, yeah. About five or six of them. So, what do you have to do? You say, all right, well, Paul Greenberg and this other 119,214,000 have these things in common. And here's a different overlap with Paul Greenberg. And some of that overlaps with 119 million, but there's about 41 million who have that. And blah, blah, blah. And you start putting all this together and you find out, hmm, if I optimize the basket of things I'm going to offer this customer, whatever they are, they could be product services or experiences. 
But if I optimize this basket and then say, hey, here's some choices you have, you're probably going to be very happy with me because there are seven or eight choices, let's say, arbitrary, that are valuable and useful to that person and makes that person feel as if you know them enough and value them enough to give them those choices. But what's interesting is there's a number associated with the number of choices. Why? Because my financial constraints only allow me to give you that number of choices. I can't just give you an unlimited amount. Sure. But those choices are valuable to out of that 200 million, let's say all in all, if we're looking at the right arrays and baskets and we can put a mix and match them and we can capture data and we can do all the other things we have to do, 197 million of them, 3 million not going to be happy no matter what we do. And but the other 197 where, million will be. And this is where you're creating the commonwealth. Right? Exactly. That's the commonwealth of self-interest, which is all those things that make my individual, satisfy my individual self-interest and his and his and hers and hers and his and hers and his, right? That's the commonwealth of self-interest. That's also how you engage a customer optimally because ultimately while as a company, all you care about is profitability and mm -hmm. uh, annual revenue increases, et cetera, et cetera. What I care about is as a customer feeling value. That's right. how, my value to me is feeling value. I don't care what you, how you make me feel valued. As long as I do feel valued, I am a happy customer. And when it boils down to, and I've said this about CRM, I've said this about customer engagement, customer experience, all of them, there's a very simple pr principle that governs all of this. And it's complex to implement, but mm -hmm. simple in concept. If a customer likes you and continues to like you, they'll continue to do business with you. If they don't, they won't. Right. So, and it is that simple. So the entire 400 pages of the book is devoted to how you do all this. Yeah, because let's, because let's face it, right? Uh, so if you ask a thousand uh, companies, uh, are you are you customer centric? And they'll go, oh, we're one hundred percent customer centric. We, you know, we're always focused on the customer, but it doesn't really play out in how they operate, right? And what you're talking about now is you you obviously have to take a very considered and strategic approach to customer engagement, right? And you're nailing it. And the key is strategic. Look, customer centrism, as much as it's a great term, it's, it's great very bump. tactical. It's bump very tactical. <laughs> I'll, give you, I'll give you a great story, which I've repeated many times, but I love this story, uh, which is the difference between what, what most people think of as customer centric and what I'm calling customer centric versus customer engaged. Mm -hmm. Okay, customer engaged is where I'm going for. Customer centric is fine, but they're not interchangeable. So here's the story. So back 2013, Ryanair, which is not known to be customer centric, <laughs> a good a good Irish company. That's, <laughs> maybe laugh, maybe think of that immediately. Actually, yeah. by the way, you you come from one of my favorite, not only one of my, arguably my favorite European country. Period, and I and my favorite whiskey comes from your country, your country of birth. And I'm married to a person who is, let's say, their origins are strongly from your country of birth, although they're in Newfoundland. They're from Newfoundland. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So, uh, so you are literally like my favorite human automatically. <laughs> so think of this. So Ryanair uh, 2013 has a, two profit warnings, freaks the board of directors out completely. And they tell, uh, what's his name, Michael O'Leary, yeah. fix this now. Fix this right away. Yeah, yeah. Well, he implements a program whose name is escaping me, but what it is, is a program that was caught is customer centric and it, the irony of this program by the way is all the things we normally expect of airlines but for them it's very vastly customer centric so for <laughs> example uh if you if you make a reservation and you decide you need to change with it change it you have 24 hours to do it without fee in the past <laughs> as yeah. soon as you make it you hit with a fee if you decide to change it five minutes later yeah. Right, you can now bring two pieces of luggage on board. <laughs> that was like new. You can bring cell phones on board, which you never could bring a mobile device on board. Things like that were um, were added to this program. Mm -hmm. But the program itself was incredibly successful, and consequently, the proper warnings went away. Everything cleared up. Michael uh, Michael uh, Leary's uh, Leary's comment on this was: I'm not kidding. If I had known being nice to people would work this well, I would have done it sooner. <laughs> That's a real quote. Yeah. 
I mean, I have to say it's kind of refreshing for being so blunt, but yeah, well, they they you gotta hand it to Ryanair. They one thing they've never been is is subtle or or, oh. or, or nebulous, that's for sure. <laughs> so, but that's if you look at that on the, at its core, it's customer centric what he did, but it's tactical. If the board of directors saying, ah, we need to cut that program back to save some money for efficiency, he would. Mm-hmm. Where if you're customer engaged, it's in your DNA, it's in your DNA as a company to provide mutual value, right, for your customer. It's mutual. Uh, two things on that. A couple of days ago, it might have been yesterday, Forbes came out with an article, which I haven't fully read yet. I'm just reading it now. Um, I got interrupted. It's what happened. Uh, on C- 200 CEOs of major companies who are claiming that their, their primary interest is no longer just making money, but is provide effectively yeah. That's providing cool. value to customer. Do I actually believe that? No, I don't. Uh, I believe there are some of them who are. I believe the vast majority of them are saying what they're supposed to say, mm-hmm. right? Um, because it's the thing you got. But, you know, the important thing is the upward pressure is so strong they have to say it, right? That's number one. And number two is there's a company in, um, in Sri Lanka, it's a telco, right, called uh, Dialog Axiata. And Dialog Axiata is DNA level customer engagement. They literally measure uh, customer engagement every and customer experience every day. Mm-hmm. They are they believe in what they call service from the heart. And I'll give you an example of how they figure that out. They feel, look, we're telco. We're an important part of the infrastructure of Sri Lanka, which means we're part of every Sri Lankan's life. Mm-hmm. Consequently, we have to view ourselves as part of Sri Lankan's life not right. just a company making phones and equipment. So they develop, at the same time, they're a you know, AAA bond rated business. Mm-hmm. And um, so they developed this thing, short codes, right? They have all these short code services. They, they did some research on the engagement. They found that they had, for some reason, an enormous number of pregnant women on their network. And um, they went and dug deeper into that. And they said, what, what's your biggest pain point? Like, what's your biggest, I don't Think they meant pain point, but you know, <laughs> know what their biggest pain point is. But um, their their biggest concern, okay. And it turns out that they just want to have a means to ask doctors questions without actually having to physically go for an appointment, because you know it's hard. Number sure. one, they're pregnant for God's sake. It's hard to travel. And number two, the roads in Sri Lanka aren't that great. Yeah, I'm sure. So they came up with a short code service. Type in the number in your text messaging area, send it, we'll come back, we'll be, okay, Dr. So-and-so can talk to you, here's dates and times, pick one, send it back, and then whatever you sent back that day on that mobile phone, they get a call from that doctor to answer those questions, right? right? Which is fantastic. Yeah. And you know, this small fee, it gets you to your phone bill, seamless, saves them an unbelievable amount of difficulty and pain wildly successful but this is the company because in their dna is value to the customer not just value to themselves yeah. and if they are part of the life of that human being that is their customer who has a life beyond being their customer yeah. so and why is it so hard do you think for a lot of companies to see the imp- impact because as, as we said earlier i mean it needs to be strategic so every engagement but we still, all of us, engage with companies every day that frustrate the uh, the heck out of you because they do everything they can not to be engaging. Well, I mean, it's ultimately, and I'm being a little simplistic here, two reasons. One is the leadership are a bunch of jackasses, and that mm-hmm. can be a problem. I mean, and, you know, it could be as simple as that. The, the staff, the general staff of the company could be great. But the leadership, if they're not willing to invest in what they know to be right, because they're they're answering to a, a shareholder mm-hmm. right, rather than a stakeholder, mm-hmm. um, will just act like Jack and say, I, we don't care. I'll give you an example, perfect example. I don't know if you ever run across these elevators that are, uh, you have to punch a keyboard, a keypad, and then it tells you go to elevator D. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like in Marriott Marquis in New York. Yes, yeah, you know, yeah. That's the, that's the first one I came across I, that in. That's chaos, chaos isn't uh, it? Now, oh, you're exactly right. I was on the, that elevator with a guy, and he told me in a very quick time, because they're not slow, um, that he's one of the architects of this system. 
And he said, look, this system is not designed to be people friendly at all. We designed it to simply be efficient. I said, well, you failed. <laughs> yeah, on both, on both. I, yeah. I said, well, you, but, you succeeded on the not people friendly. <laughs> yeah, he got that right. Got that. But that's the thing. It was conscious design to sacrifice the, the help, the support of the customers to the efficiency of the system. Mm -hmm. Again, failed on both counts, but or succeeded on not friendly. You're right. So, but that's what I mean. Those things are decisions. Yeah. That's one level. The other level is just inefficient knowledge. You know, like a lot of people just don't know how to do stuff and they do it poorly because they don't know how to do it. And it's typical, you know, like, you know, we always say, uh, we, you always have these people, you run across these customers who say, well, I have CRM. They say, oh, yeah, well, who are you using? They'll go, oh, we built our own. <laughs> and I say, well, what do you do for a living? We're auto parts. <laughs> I said, well, let me ask you a question. If, if, a CRM company, an actual technology company, built their own auto parts. Do you think the car would actually run? <laughs> right? I don't think so. I said, it doesn't work that way, right? I yeah. said, but this doesn't mean a lot of these thing, companies think they can do these things that they can't. Mm -hmm. Look, I'm a perfect example. I have advocated for years, don't build your own. Bring in someone. You know, yeah. Bring in a pipeline or bring in a, a, a Zoho. Bring in a Salesforce. Bring in a whoever. I don't care. But bring in the right company. All right? And many years ago, five years ago, uh, I, I, I weighed 257 pounds. Right now, I weigh 196, 195, right in that range. Mm -hmm. Now, for years, I've been trying to lose weight. Couldn't lose. Well, well what did I, I exercise? I ate sure. properly and so on and so forth. One day, I was sitting there. And I'm not kidding. This is the actual thought I went through. And I said, you know, I have consistently advocated with every part company I ever run across don't build your own CRM system because you don't know how to do it. Right. Go find a CRM provider who can do it for you. And here I am trying to do my own thinking on how to do exercise. So I went to the Duke Diet and Fitness Center for a week who knows how to do it. And from then on, that, uh, the, the weight melted off. Like, uh, I had to follow a program. It was pretty sure, intense, sure, sure, sure. But I did. And because they taught me what to do and then gave me a program to follow through once I left. And I followed through and I've never gained back a pound because mm -hmm. I stuck to what they taught me. Is and there any way I would have come to my own conclusion on this? No, I was wrong the whole time. Yeah, I've it's, been all doing the, it's all about core competencies, isn't it? I mean, right. just because you're good at one thing doesn't necessarily, and I think companies often, you know, they suffer from some hubris or whatever. They start to think, well, we're good at this and we're so good at this that we're going to be better than you are at the thing that you're good at. <laughs> yeah, and then the answer is no, you're not, because yeah. that's why we're good at it and you're, you're not doing it, yeah. right? So, I mean, it never happened. It's, it's, that's a, a massive fallacy that's existed for years that you can do your own thing with this stuff. You can't. You know, you need to, you, and there's no reason to. It's, look, we, I deal with it even in our, as, you know, as you know, one of my other roles sure. in life, aside from my, you know, advisory stuff, is as an analyst. And I deal with companies all the time. I mean, when I say all the time, I mean, like in our, in our world, the technology world, who are always telling me, look, um, you know, uh, well, we're not, we, there's no reason for us to partner with them or acquire them because we could build it ourselves. Uh, uh, yeah. And the reality is, yeah, you probably could, but guess what? Why? It's already there. <laughs> Say we want to spend $12 million or $25 million building something that you just literally have to sign a partnership agreement to get and then spend maybe, I don't know, 100000 on an integration. Yeah. Why would you do that? And yeah. again, it goes to your point, which is hubris, arrogance, right? Yeah. Arrogance. Um, is, unfortunately, it is. I mean, we made our, ourselves, a, you know, a pipeline and made the strategic decision that we were just going to focus on sales, like we're a sales CRM, period. Um, we're not a customer server. We're not a marketing automation, whatever. Those aren't, those aren't our core competencies. Um, but we made the decision, but we'll make it easy to integrate. Right. I, that's where I was just going to go. I, one thing I do know is you're, well, you have a lot of integrations you can do. And, um, and I, that's, you know what, it's realistic because that's the other side. If you're building out an ecosystem, mm -hmm. you also have to think through, okay, what is it we do? What kind of, what is it we want to provide? What is it we, what is it we need to get to do what we want to provide? And then uh, how much of that do we have? How much of that are we just not going to bother with? How much of that are we going to partner to get? And that's it. 
you just yep. make those decisions and then you go ahead and do it. I know another look, a good example, just because I like them so much, and I've advised these guys for, I don't know, six years, mm -hmm. seven years, is the Thunderhead stuff. Look, they're customer journey orchestration. They win all the time in the forest. They win all these things all the time. But that's what they do. They're not a CRM system. Mm -hmm. they're, not, um, they're not even, um, I mean, I guess they have, they have strong analytics, but they're, sure. not, they're not business analytics. They're not, uh, they're not they ha and their power is not in standalone. It's an integration with all of those things. Look, Salesforce OEM them into, uh, you know, Interaction Studio. So, which is amazing for both companies. Sure. Both, of, But that's when you're thinking straight. If you're not mm -hmm. thinking straight, we'll just go and do it alone. Yeah, like, yeah. We'll, 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 run, we'll run over here and then we'll all run over there and then we'll all run over yeah, the other. And I, I imagine, and I don't know this for a fact, but I know you guys are intelligent, so I know you're probably doing what I'm about to suggest. Is I imagine Pipeliner, for example, if you need to integrate with, and again, I'm not saying you integrate with this specific one. I'm just going sure. to integrate with exactly or the comp side sales compensation. It used to be Calidus Cloud, but mm -hmm. now I say you could. Yeah, right. Because Absolutely. I don't think you offer sales comp, if I remember correctly. No, so, no, no. We're we're not, and and we have, and that's like I said, that's exactly what we've done. Right. Is now we've focused a lot on making integration as simple as possible. And we can pretty much integrate with anybody these days. And I, that's the thing I do remember really well about. Pipeliners, your integration was pretty extensive. I, I some reason I don't know why it's sticking in my head, but I remember something you were doing around HubSpot a while ago. I don't know why that's in my head. Uh, we, it's just uh, a, this is yeah. a year. Ago. I mean, we do integrate, but that's not it's not a no, no. It wasn't a big thing. It was just yeah. something that came up that you were integrated with HubSpot yeah. somewhere. Yeah, so we, as I said, we're integrated with a bunch of people today. But I think that's the. I think getting back to what we were talking about, I think that is the, the essential point though is that, you've got to figure out what you're good at, stick with what you're good at, and then work with others. And just and just as we're rounding up on, on your on your book, the Commonwealth of Interest, I think, as we've said, if you're going to do real customer engagement, uh, you have to approach it strategically because at the end of the day, um, if you don't have all the constituent parts working properly for customer engagement, the one part, the, it's like the, you know, that, that age old saying, what is it, the weakest link in the chain, right? Yeah. Well, if it breaks, it breaks the whole notion. Now, you only have to have one bad engagement or one negative engagement to wipe out all the good ones you've ever had, right? Yeah, and ultimately, look, you get, you're depending on strategy, programs, operational capabilities. The biggest, uh, the biggest thing, culture, a culture mm -hmm. that supports and sustains, right. uh, you know, you, valuable engagement. I mean, you're 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 literally on measurement, on technology. All of these things come into play when you're building out a true engagement, uh, a customer engaged company. I'll say, mm -hmm. and and the. The idea of the book really is I cover literally all of it. That's why it's as big as it is. Excellent. All right, listen, Paul, we're bumping up against the end of our time. Um, we've gone long, actually, because it was such an interesting conversation. So thank you for, for staying um, longer. Um, the book is The Commonwealth of, Commonwealth of Self-Interest, uh, Paul Greenberg. If you want to tell people a little bit more about yourself, how they can learn more about you as well. Well, uh, you can pretty much just, if you're smart, there will be a website being launched in about, even though I'm only maybe two and a half years from like doing other things in my life, but <laughs> there will be a website launched in about a month, maybe of, at the 56 group, dot, the 56 group.com. Mm -hmm. But until then, best bet, honestly, Google me in quotes, Paul Greenberg, comma, CRM, because there's about a million Paul Greenbergs, <laughs> and you'll find thousands of references to me and all of them pretty much the same so. yeah well there may be thousands but there's only one godfather of crm so there you go Probably not me, though. <laughs> <laughs> listen uh, paul this has been fascinating my name is john golden sales pop online sales magazine pipeline at crm listen i really appreciate you making so much time for us today you're a um, good man sir all right thank you very much i appreciate it <laughs>